So Patagonia, the company that makes overpriced vests for tech bros who pretend to be outdoorsy, got a metric fuckload of good headlines this month when their billionaire owner, Yvonne Chouinard, announced that he was donating the entire company to fight climate change. Twitter exploded in jubilation. The Washington Post said, finally, a billionaire willing to smack back at capitalism. Even the beloved environmentalist Bill McKibben said, if every company was as decent as Patagonia, the world would work better and people would be cozy all winter. Now, this is a wonderful story. I would love to believe that there's a good billionaire out there looking out for the planet from atop his pile of money. But you can feel what's coming, can't you? I mean, I wouldn't be making this video if there weren't a darker truth to expose. Am I really gonna do this? Am I actually gonna disagree with Patagonia, the media, and Bill McKibben, a man I deeply respect and admire, and tell the world why this feel-good story is actually terrible? Fuck yeah, I am. Not only was this donation designed to help Chenard avoid billions of dollars in taxes, the fact that it's even possible for a billionaire to pull this maneuver is an unmitigated disaster for the planet and for our democracy. And when we swallow PR like this, we are literally falling for the oldest billionaire bullshit in the book. Now, a lot of people found this story believable, including me at first, because it fits Chenard's carefully cultivated public image. He's been described for years as the reluctant billionaire, a frugal rock climber who just loved making gear for his friends, then tripped and accidentally started a $3 billion company. People tell stories about Chenard eating cans of cat food to save money, and he famously still drives a Subaru instead of a fancy car. The dude supposedly doesn't even own a cell phone, which is maybe why he doesn't know that human food is just as cheap as cat food. You weren't saving money, Yvonne. You were just being weird. And as far as corporations go, Patagonia does have a solid environmental record. They've donated over $140 million to a huge number of organizations, promoting everything from land conservation to biodiversity to sustainable agriculture to the end of fossil fuels. Now, Chenard said that he wanted the company's commitment to the planet to continue after his death. So instead of selling the company to some corner-cutting capitalist who would start powering the fleeced vest factories with coal and, I don't know, cancel the Batgirl movie again, he decided to donate all of his stock to a nonprofit organization with a mission of helping the planet. In a New York Times piece so glowing it might as well have been written by his publicist, Chenard said that hopefully this donation will influence a new form of capitalism that doesn't end with a few rich people and a whole bunch of poor people. And his own accountant said that he'll receive no tax benefit for his donation whatsoever. But if you want the straight story about a billionaire's finances, it might make sense to ask someone other than the guy who cooks the books for him. The truth is, if Chenard really just wanted to make sure that Patagonia's value value stayed intact, he didn't need to donate it to a nonprofit. He could have just given all $3 billion worth of shares to his kids. They could have kept running the company according to Daddy Dearest's wishes and lovingly rapped about him at corporate board meetings. So why didn't he do that? Simple. He would have had to pay $1.2 billion in gift taxes. And Yvonne's a good billionaire, so he doesn't like paying taxes. I mean, why should he have to pay for the roads his products are transported on, the schools and universities his workers are educated at, the GPS system that he uses to track his shipments, and the government research into heart attacks and cancer that have kept him alive until the ripe old age of 83. I mean, he's self-made, right? He did it all by himself. Now I know what you're thinking. Adam, he didn't pay taxes because he did something better. He donated it to charity. Well. Let's take a look at how charitable that donation actually was. 98% of the shares Chenard donated were given to a brand new environmental nonprofit he formed called the Holdfast Collective. Kind of a weird name, sort of sounds like a mid-2000s Brooklyn indie band, but more about that in a second. The other 2% though were Chenard's voting shares. These are the shares that let you actually control what the company does. And these shares were given to something called the Patagonia Purpose Trust, which is solely controlled by Chenard and his family. What this means is that even though all the headlines said Chenard was donating the company to charity, he and his family will continue to control Patagonia forever. You know, I didn't know that was how donations worked. When I donate my car to 1-800-CARS-FOR-KIDS, I can't show up the next weekend and take it for a joyride but Yvonne and his family can. Now the family did have to pay about $17 million in gift taxes to execute this maneuver, but don't forget, they already saved $1.2 billion by donating the other 98% to charity. So they came out roughly $1.2 billion ahead. That shit's not even a rounding error. So what about that other 98%? And who exactly is the Holdfast Collective? Well, 
They're actually pretty mysterious. They don't even have a website. And when you Google them, you just find a bunch of Reddit threads of people asking, what the hell is the Holdfast Collective? But what we do know from the New York Times is that the Holdfast Collective will receive roughly $100 million a year in profit from Patagonia, and that they plan to use that money to influence the US political system. See, regular nonprofits are what's called 501c3s. 501c3s are required to use the money for charitable purposes and are barred from making political contributions. But the Holdfast Collective is a 501c4, and that means it's allowed to use that money to donate to politicians, super PACs, and even to conduct direct political campaigning. And since it's safe to assume that the Holdfast Collective is going to be basically run by the Chouinard family, considering they founded it and control its money supply, that means Yvonne was able to take his $3 billion company and turn it into a $3 billion political influence machine tax free. He didn't pay capital gains tax on the growth of the company. He didn't pay the income tax that I would have to pay before I donate to my favorite 501c4. And he definitely didn't pay the gift taxes you normally have to pay if you want to give $3 billion in money and political influence to your kids. That's right, Patagonia made the jackets, but it was the rest of us who got fleeced. That's a Patagonia pun. Let's be clear. Because of their control of Patagonia and Holdfast, Chouinard's descendants are going to wield massive political power for their entire lives. They're going to be invited to meetings with powerful elected leaders. They'll be flown around the world to conferences. They'll be lauded as great philanthropists until the day they die when their kids will take over as money bags in chief. Chouinard has turned his money into permanent political power for him and his descendants, and I do not think he should get a tax break for doing it. And look, I'll grant Chouinard's good intentions here. I think that in addition to wanting to save money on his taxes, he and his family are motivated by a sincere desire to help the planet. And I think their donation, taken in isolation, will do that. But we can't take it in isolation. Because Chouinard is not the only billionaire pulling this move. And the other billionaires are a lot less cuddly than Mr. Puffer Vest for the planet. Let's talk about a different billionaire named Barry Side. The wonderful investigative journalism outfit ProPublica did an expose this year on Side when he pulled the exact same move as Yvonne, he donated his entire fortune to charity. But Twitter and the New York Times didn't throw a party in Barry's honor. Why? Because the charity he donated to was run by Leonard Leo, the right-wing activist who spent the last couple decades stacking the Supreme Court with radical conservatives. You know, the same conservatives who recently overturned Roe v. Wade and banned the EPA from regulating greenhouse gases. Cheering on Chouinard's abuse of the system just because you agree with his cause doesn't make sense. It's like cheering for a baseball player who does steroids. Sure, it's nice when he hits a home run for your team, but when all the other teams are doing it too, you get your ass kicked and it kind of fucks the game up. It's also, how to put this, the opposite of democracy. See, everyone sees the world differently and everyone has different needs. And that means that no one person has all the answers. So the central insight of democracy is that we need to spread power widely and diversely among many different types of people if we want to solve our biggest problems. But billionaires like Chouinard are doing the opposite. He's hoarding power, even if he feels that he's using it for good. But why should the owner of a fancy clothing company get to decide what's good or not? Why don't we all decide it? together. You know, maybe the billionaires could kick in their fair share to a communal pool of money we all contribute to, and then we could vote on what to spend it on. I don't know, just a crazy idea I found on this dusty old scroll. But no, instead, our system allows a few wealthy people to amass disgusting amounts of wealth and then gives them a tax break when they use it to influence our political system. And that is no way to run a society. Democracy only works when everybody has a voice. So instead of applauding Chouinard, we do a lot better to take that power back for ourselves. Now, I think that argument is pretty straightforward. Open and shut, video could end right there. Except that when I posted about this on Twitter, I was deluged with hate from angry billionaire fans. And I started to realize that something deeper is going on here. I mean, people really love this cat food eating, Subaru driving, humble billionaire who cares. And they get very mad at you if you criticize him. I mean, he's got a great brand and people love it. I love it too. I love my Patagonia jacket. When I wear it, I feel like I'm in that Wes Anderson movie where Bill Murray is sad in the 60s. No, not that one, the other one. No, not that one, the other one. 
No, not that one, the other. That's the one, thank you. All right, there's three more though. But here's the problem. That story, that brand, isn't real. It's PR, it's marketing, it's spin, baby. Let me tell you about a little place called Bentonville, Arkansas. So a few weeks back, I was booked to MC an event at Crystal Bridges Art Museum in Bentonville, a beautiful small town in northwestern Arkansas that also happens to be the home of one of the most lavish and expensive art museums in America. Why there? <laughs> well, a clue might be in the name you see emblazoned all over town, Walmart. Sam Walton opened the first Walmart store in Bentonville in 1962, and now that it's the largest retailer in the world, yes, larger than Amazon, its headquarters are still in Bentonville. Sam Walton is now dead, but his kids, the 11th, 12th, and 13th richest people in America, have poured money into the town. They've built miles of bike trails all around the surrounding area. They've preserved the beautiful, historic town square, and they've built a $200 million art museum. But, that's not the only museum I visited in Bentonville that weekend. Housed in a replica of an old-fashioned five-and-dime store is the Walmart Museum, a monument to Sam Walton's humility and humble decency. They have an exact replica of his shabby home office, which actually like brought a tear to my eye because it reminded me so strongly of my own grandfather's office when I was a kid. And according to this museum, Sam hated money so much that he drove a beat up old truck. And to prove it, they put the beat up old truck in the museum. Holy shit, swap the pickup for a Subaru and this could be the Patagonia Museum. Now there's something a little perverse in building an entire museum to tell people how humble and thrifty you are, but it works. People in this town love the Waltons, and when I struck up a conversation with them, they talked about the Waltons like they were family. Because of the Waltons' investment, the population of Bentonville has sextupled. Property values have skyrocketed. Oh, and don't forget the world-class art museum they built in town, where Bentonville residents can chill out and look at a Rothko, listen to an artist of color, give a talk, or visit one of Yayoi Kasuma's famous infinity rooms. When I was waiting in line for this exhibit, I overheard two teenagers talking about how they had never been to an art museum before. And hearing that, you know, made my heart swell up. Like, this is a part of the country that has been left out of cultural investment for a century, and the Waltons are changing that. That is unequivocally a good thing. But there's also a deep irony in Bentonville that makes visiting it almost creepy. Because even though the Waltons have preserved this perfect American small town, they only had the money to do so because they have destroyed the downtowns of so many other cities in America. According to a 2008 study from MIT, Walmart was responsible for 40 to 50% of the decline in small discount stores like the ones their museum was built to resemble. Other researchers found that when Walmart comes to town, it correlates with increased obesity, higher crime rates, and lower overall employment in that area. And this proves that the narrative Sam Walton spun about himself, that he never cared about money, he was just a humble guy who loved giving back. Well, it was bullshit. There are no accidental billionaires. The only way to make that kind of money is on purpose. This dude devoted his life to building the biggest, most profitable company he could, and then he used that money to tell a sweet and cuddly story about himself to distract from all the evil shit he did. And even though I don't think the average Patagonia wearer is a big fan of Walmart, it bears pointing out how closely the story Chouinard tells about himself resembles Walton's. The reluctant billionaire rock climber who doesn't care about money, drives a beat up old car, and loves giving back is a great story but it's also marketing, and Chouinard tells it because it benefits him and Patagonia to do so. I mean, how many made in Vietnam puffer vests have they sold over the years because somebody looked at them and said, hey, he's the good billionaire, I'm gonna help him save the planet. Hell, if you go to patagonia.com right now, they are using that story to sell you more overpriced crap. But look, none of this is new. The truth is that billionaires have been telling this story about themselves since the first proto-capitalist took his first quivering steps out of the money swamp. Let's do a quick review of the Billionaire Bullshit Hall of Fame. Mark Zuckerberg got incredible headlines when he said he was donating his fortune to charity in 2015. Then it turned out that charity was just an LLC he controls that invests in for-profit businesses. For years, people have described Bill Gates as saving the world. He even made his own Netflix documentary about what a generous genius he is. Of course, that's before we learned he's a serial sexual harasser who became best buddies with Jeffrey Epstein 
after he was convicted of sex crimes. Bill was like, oh, this dude's a sex offender? Well, what's he doing Thursday? And finally, Warren Buffett, a man who decades of PR have described as so saintedly frugal that websites post listicles about how you can live as cheaply as him, with tips like, eat a cheap breakfast. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if I ate Egg McMuffins all day, it wouldn't make me a billionaire. I'd just have a heart attack. I mean, this article literally says that Warren Buffett clips coupons. No, he fucking doesn't. Are you trying to tell me that Warren fucking Buffett gets up on a Tuesday, goes and gets the newspaper off his porch, takes out the advertising section and a pair of scissors and says, oh look, Skippy is on sale? Fuck you, how gullible do you think we are? You know how Warren really saves money? by not paying his taxes. When ProPublica got a leak of billionaire tax returns, Buffett was found to pay the least of any of his fellow plutocrats. Dude made $24 billion between 2014 and 2018 and paid a true tax rate of 0.1%. Even greedy little piggies like Bezos and Musk can't touch that. Instead of paying the public the money he owes us, Buffett has famously pledged to give away his money to charity. Which charity, you might ask? Oh, just the one his buddy Bill runs with the ex-wife he cheated on. Wow, billionaires donating to billionaires brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? Now, if all of this weren't enough for you, it becomes piercingly clear that the entire concept of billionaire charity is bullshit when you look at where it originated. In the Gilded Age of the late 19th century, the OG evil monopolist Andrew Carnegie wrote an essay called The Gospel of Wealth, in which he famously argued that it's the responsibility of the wealthy to give away their fortunes during their lifetimes. He even argued that it's the duty of a rich man to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display or extravagance. So Chouinard and Walton weren't radicals by driving beat up old cars, they were literally taking their instructions from Daddy Carnegie. Now critically, Carnegie argued for that kind of charity because he believed that the system that gave him such unimaginable wealth was a good thing and that it was inevitable. It was just the way of the universe. But even at the time, in the late 19th century, Americans knew that this was bullshit. They knew that Carnegie's wealth was the result of a broken system and that it came at the expense of the customers he gouged, the workers he exploited, and the political system he dominated. A political system that ensured workers had no right to organize, no minimum wage, and allowed plutocrats to hire thugs to beat the shit out of them whenever they asked for their fair share. Carnegie's Gilded Age concealed a rot at the core of the economy, and in the years after his death, the country went through a little something called the Great Depression. Huh, turns out letting so much wealth accumulate in so few hands wasn't a great idea. The New Deal that Franklin Delano Roosevelt launched in response was strongly influenced by progressive reformers who were alarmed at the excesses of Gilded Age plutocrats like Carnegie. Roosevelt introduced stronger labor protections, a minimum wage, strong antitrust enforcement so that monopolies couldn't form, and perhaps most importantly, a high level of taxation on the wealthy. And it worked. The labor movement flourished, which led directly to the creation of the American middle class. Average Americans, average white Americans anyway, were able to make a living wage, save for retirement, and build wealth of their own. Wealthy people still existed and they were still able to make money, but the age of titanic billionaires running the country as their personal empires seemed to be over. If you're trying to remember who the Mark Zuckerberg of the 1950s was, I'll give you a hint, there wasn't one. But over the following decades, starting in the 70s and 80s, the policies that created this incredible level of prosperity started to be dismantled. Deregulation of the financial industry, weakened antitrust enforcement, tax cuts, welfare reduction, and the gutting of the labor movement all contributed to skyrocketing inequality. Most people, average Americans, saw their wages stagnate or fall. But the rich did well, and the very rich did very well, and the obscenely rich did obscenely fucking well. And the result is that today, the top 0.1% own nearly as much wealth as the bottom 90%. Today, we are living in a new gilded age in which billionaires are allowed to amass massive wealth and then convert it into political power tax-free so they can run the country while everyone else suffers. And it's an age in which we swallow the same tired myth over and over again, that these billionaires are humble, they don't really like money, and that they're heroes for giving it away in ways that just happen to increase their own power. And the purpose of this myth, this lie, is to distract us from the fact that this system is bad for the planet and disastrous for our society. 
So no, I, I'm not going to applaud Chenard for donating his money to the planet. Instead, I think we need to demand policies that prevent guys like him from amassing so much money to begin with, and that put power back in the hands of the people where it belongs. And I promise, if we do that, and we can do it because we have done it before, you can keep your jacket. Hell, you can get a few more jackets. Maybe you'll even be able to afford an actual trip to Patagonia instead of wearing it on a logo you bought at the mall. Hey guys, this is the first YouTube video I've done like this. I wanna thank Sam Raubman and Brian Frange who helped me write it. If you enjoyed it, I believe the parlance is smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment if you enjoyed it. If you really enjoyed it, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Thanks so much for watching, see you next time.